Good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome to Words on Whiskey, episode 45. And happy Bloom's Day for all you Joycians out there. A big uh, occasion in the literary world today. And quite fittingly, we're, we're going to be joined by a, a great literary writer uh, you know, of the whiskey type. So belt up and uh, get ready for a show that I think is going to be really exciting and uh, very interesting. So our guest this evening is none other than Dominic Roscoe, uh, a legend in his own right, uh, revered, I think, and a cult following throughout the world uh, in terms of whiskey writing and his thoughts on whiskey. Often outspoken, uh, very strong-minded and opinionated, but very often right, uh, more often than not. And really, he's taken whiskey across the world for the last 20 years with his chatty and frank and clear writing, uh, no nonsense, no frills, straight to the point, and a, a different attitude towards whiskey, which I think is something that is really appreciated by the general public. So it's no errors and graces. It, it's clear, concise, interesting, human, and passionate writing, which is something that you don't see an awful lot about. So look, Let's cut to the chase. We're going to introduce Dominic Roscoe. So you're all very welcome. And, you know, it is an opportunity to pose some questions to Dominic. I'm sure he'll be delighted. And uh, it's not every day we get a legend of, of whiskey, world whiskey on the show. So good evening, Dominic. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for that really amazing introduction. Oh, well, I heard the word two or three times today, legend. I've never been a legend. So, uh, um, it's your modesty. Um, it, well, it's very nice for you to say that, but uh, and also you call me a literary genius or something similar. No, I'm not that either. Oh. Um, fortunately, I'm uh, I'm the tabloid journalism of the whiskey world. Uh, that's a skill in its own right, but it's not literary. <laughs> well, it's a skill in its own right, and I suppose you know making the complicated, what can be sometimes overcomplicated world of whiskey approachable for for many people, and still maintaining its integrity as well and giving the level of detail that two people do want. So, you know, and you, like I said, you've been doing that for a very long time. So, um, hello, Eric. We've got Eric here from the Netherlands and we've got the cask as well. So, yeah, I know you're good friends with John. John, good evening. Hi. Hello. So, uh, Dom, I suppose let's take it back to the very beginning. Obviously, you are born and bred in England, but you do have a strong New Zealand links, is it? Or is that just something that you've taken to that you've a strong interest in? No, I. so my background is um, I, I, I was born in Kent in England, and I was brought up in England. I've never lived anywhere else until adulthood. Uh, but I come from a, a Catholic family on my mother's side uh, with strong Irish links, yeah. uh, very socialist, very left wing family. The Lionet family, if you if you go to Darlington in the northeast of England and look up Lionet, you'll find all sorts of references to my relatives on my mother's side. Rosgro is a Cornish name. And so I have links to Cornwall. And if you find a Rosgro anywhere in the world, there'll be a mine nearby because <laughs> they came from tin mining. Um Having said all that, that's give, trying to give me a lot of credibility because it makes me sound like I'm, you know, from some working class background and uh, socialist from a working class background and all that. The reality is that my dad did very well and we were brought up in Leicester. We moved to Leicester when I was three or four and I was brought up in Leicester in a sub suburb of Leicester that was that's called Odeby. And Odeby is very middle class. So um and I've, I've always found it very easy to move to different places. I, I find it very easy. But um Back in 87, there was an opportunity to go and work in New Zealand, and I took it, and after three years, I took citizenship. So I am okay. I have a New Zealand passport, which I intend to use because I'm quite ashamed of mm. uh, our Brexit links and the lack of – I feel very close to my Celtic roots and to my both Celts because Irish Celts and Scottish Celts are very different to Welsh and Brittany and Cornish Celts but because Celt really only means – foreign that's is effectively no that's sorry that's wrong gaelic means foreign but um but but there are different breeds of celts and the, and the ones in where i'm from are not irish or scottish uh on okay. on on that father's side of the family so so i kind of got you know 
my wife said to me, I was doing some work for the for the Welsh whisky industry recently, and my wife said to me, I'm sure you can find a Welsh connection somewhere, but I can't. No, <laughs> nothing there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you do have strong social uh, political beliefs uh, and you know, you've been quite outspoken about Brexit, I think, as well. And But in terms of personally, ha has that affected you uh, much? Um, I don't know yet, is the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question, really, because the, th thing, the thing is that I, I was always totally opposed to Brexit, but I totally understand why the north of England, Darlington, which is where my family's from, being a classic case, yeah. Hartlepool and Darlington are next to each other, and they gave some of the biggest votes for Brexit in the, in the whole of the country. And the reason for that was very, very simple. I've said many times, if you could tell me how you can get Ireland to operate without a hard border in the Irish Sea, and you can guarantee that Scottish and Cornish fishermen will be able to uh, be free to fish as they want mm -hmm. within limits, but to expand their quotas, etc., I'll vote Brexit. It's never going to happen. And yeah. sure enough, here we are. Scotland's uh, fishing industry has been on its knees. Cornish whiskey industry, uh, uh, Cornish fishing industry is struggling. We're about to have a very, very lively summer in Northern Ireland, unfortunately. So, um, so Brexit on that level, it's been massive. I mean, we 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 had it every day. I yeah. don't know how much time Ireland spent on it, but we spent a two years. Every single day, it was. Yeah. I mean, it's like the pandemic. To have a back-to-back -back Brexit debate for two years and then the pandemic has been hell. Me personally, at the moment, I make most of my income from working with companies. Um, I, I mean, I write about world whiskey, and I do it this way. I do it online, yeah. and I'm as close to that industry as I have been for, for this magazine. Uh, my new magazine has just really helped me do that. Uh, get back close to all those people and the new generation of these people. But the big but is when do we start traveling again and what's it going to be like for an Englishman in France? You know, I've got a New Zealand passport and that's why I got it. I got yeah. it last year in Brexit because, uh, sorry, in um, lockdown because I thought I don't want to go through the debate with a French official who's going to make my life hard because I'm English. Um mm -hmm. Switzerland has fallen out with Europe. They've been talking to Europe for seven years. At the moment, they have this Schengen Agreement. And although it was used a lot in this country as an example of how you could have an open border, it was never an open border. You cross a, uh, uh, Arthur Nagel, my friend Arthur Nagel, who writes about spirits, he, he lives in Austria, but he works in Switzerland. Right. And we cross, so we cross that border many, many times. And it's empty, but it's a border post. Yeah. And then it would just get defiled in Northern Ireland or on the Irish border. It would just get wrecked regularly if it was there because because it symbolises so much. Yes. Um, but six times a day, maybe three times a day, I don't know, the police turn up and they spend an hour there. So it is actually, actually occupied for some of the time. And what they do is they film people going from – they watch people coming back from Austria into Switzerland – because Switzerland is much, much more expensive than the European Union. So Swiss people like to cross the border and get petrol or there's a load of brothels just across the border because it's cheap sex. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm joking in a sense, but it's not funny. Yeah. Um, constantly you're aware that I, I, and yet they integrate very well. The, the, the southern Germany, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Austria, all very quite close. But there is a border. So. Who knows? Uh, Switzerland was trying to – what they were trying to do was get a simple agreement between the European Union and Switzerland because at the moment it's a mass of different uh, contracts and agreements. And after seven years, those talks have fallen down. Now, I happen to work for a Swiss company. Yes, yeah. I mean, I know you're doing some work there with uh, Seven Seals, and we'll talk about that, I suppose, uh, down the road because that's an interesting project in itself. But uh, – yeah. I suppose today was an interesting day in the sense that you you released the second edition of your Stills Crazy publication, and I'll just share it there for people to to have a look. So that's the uh, edition number two, yeah. uh, and you, 
there's a very large section in there to do with Dr. Jim Swan, the late Dr. Sims, Jim Swan. How well did you know Jim? Uh, not very. No. Um, I spent five or six days with him in Taiwan. I, mm -hmm. In my editorial, I, I say that because of my cyclothemia, I get, I'm like a big puppy when I get anywhere. I get overexcited yeah. and I babble. And I was with, on that trip, uh, another person who was very opinionated and full of himself. And Jim Swan was there. And Stephen Davis from Penderen was there. And it was a lovely trip. And it was to Taiwan. How can you not love a trip to Taiwan? Yeah. But I cringe a little bit now because he was so quiet and so affable. He was just a nice man. and But over the time, everything he said, you suddenly thought, you know, that's a good point. He didn't, yeah. he didn't waste his time showing off or, or trying to say, look, I've done this. And you don't know what you're doing. None of that. Yeah. And I just feel a little bit cringing now because he was so far ahead of me. So I didn't know him well. Yeah. Um, but I felt I knew him, one, because I had seen him in action. So when I talked to any other distillery that had worked with him, I knew exactly what they were talking about. I just got it. So I felt I knew him better than I did, but I'm not going to lie. Yeah, uh, yeah, he wasn't my best mate. Um, yeah. I, but I, one other thing I'd say about that is that his influence when I was talking to a lot of new world distillers, uh, he, he, he kind of changed my view of how I, I was to do my job because when I set out, I wanted to write about non traditional areas, so I discounted Ireland, Scotland, Canada, Japan, and Kentucky. Yeah. Everything else was included. What I, he made me realize was that, yes, great new English distilleries, that's fine. But Nuknean or Lindora's Abbey or Speyside were also Jim Swan distilleries. And they were also independent and they were also uh, relatively small and therefore totally worthy of my attention in this magazine. So, yeah. it, so, so I felt I felt because there was a time four, five, six years ago, you talk to anybody in the industry, anybody. Mm -hmm. And you seem to come, it was like that game, five steps to Jim Swan. You know, if you found anybody in whiskey, you could easily find a link back to Jim Swan. And so, so I felt I knew him better than I did, but um, I'm not going to, I was, I just felt it wasn't done properly. I felt yeah. that, and I think the, the beauty of it is, as I said in the magazine, it's like submarines, you know, you launch a whiskey and everyone comes and says, hey, they're making whiskey. And the whiskey then goes under the surface for a long time. Yeah, and then years yeah. later it comes up, and it's a pristine whiskey. And and to me, that's happening now. A lot yeah. of it's happening now. You know, I'm, uh, I just tasted another great Cotswolds whiskey. The spirit of Yorkshire stuff is phenomenal, and and Cotswolds have, have, have won so many awards. Um, but there's others. Yeah, how many English distilleries and Welsh distilleries are there now? Are there? Are, I, I know most of them are quite small, but are, are, are you talking dozens or? Not in, no, in Wales, no, there's a couple in well, not not dozens. In, in well, well, I'll talk about Wales first. Funnily enough, I seem to be doing an awful lot of work, uh, mainly down to Stephen Davis at uh, Penderen, but they're looking at uh, getting a GI for Welsh, and I'm involved working on that. I'm not sure I'm meant to talk about that, I don't know, but I have. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I keep getting quoted on things from uh, the Welsh industry. There's another Welsh piece. Well, Pederen's in the new issue. Um, but he reckons there's, he, that I'll get samples from six or seven of them. Okay. Which I'm going to look to do some form of GI. But, I mean, there's very few Welsh distilleries that have a mature product yet, is there? Yeah. So I've got a bottle down here from Aberfell, mm -hmm. uh, which has been sent to me, and Pederen. I haven't received anything from anywhere else yet. Yeah. So um, I doubt that that, but that's the, that's the beauty of this though. So yeah. is the beauty of it is that it, it it's like looking over a, 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 a landscape in the countryside, and that field is clearly blossoming. Maybe yeah. it's rapeseed. Like we have a lot of rapeseed here. And it's bright yellow. And it's all ready to go. From my window, I can see all this. And that field has got that field over there. We've just had ten days of great weather, or nine days of great weather. And it's gone dark because that's the barley and the wheat getting to that dry level where they can harvest it. And they'll be doing that fairly soon. And then yeah. other fields, they're, they're just starting to – and they're all 
timed. Well, that's how whiskey is. So I think that, you know, people say, why would you do Jim Swan now? But I did it because it, I didn't think it was it ever, ever gave him the credibility. I think I really wanted to just show the range of distilleries that he worked with and how he did it equally and fairly and how amazing what he did was. So that's that's what I did. But England... So we have the first wave. We have St. George's, which is the first. Yeah. We have um, the Cornish whiskey, Healy and Hicks or Hicks and Healy, which they only bottled once. Right. Not sure what's going on with that. I ought to find out. I have a good story about that. I went down there to find out, and, uh, it, and it was highly amusing because they don't see themselves as English. They and, and Ross grows a Cornish name, so everybody knows in Cornwall that Ross grows Cornish. So I was right. really, really welcome. Everywhere else thinks I'm Eastern European, so but in Cornwall, especially around Red Ruth and, and that area of Cornwall, Ross grows is a, a name. There's a village called Ross, yeah. Okay, um, but I just go, um, I just want to show the first issue there that you, you brought out. So again, you know, you're celebrating world whiskey, and we'll. We maybe we'd touch on how you came to be fascinated by world whiskey, but originally, of course, you started off with scotch, uh, yeah. which is, you know, I guess uh, the logical route that you would take uh, when you're talking about whiskey. How did it all, how did you get into writing firstly? Into writing? Yeah. How, you, I mean, you started as a journalist, and I know your first job was with the Sheffield Star, but in terms of actually critiquing whiskey and talking about whiskey how did that come yeah, about it, so so what happened with that was i was uh writing for train magazines in london and i went on a press trip and the pr girl who she was very frustrated with me she was very frustrated because i never turned up to anything <laughs> so she said she'd send me a taxi from north london where i lived yeah. at six o'clock in the morning and drive me all the way down to South London where this press trip was starting. And if I did that, she'd pay for everything to do it. So, so that's what I did. And I got to the uh, meeting point and they gave me a bacon butty and a, and a cup of coffee. And I joke about this. That's the last time she's ever made me a cup of coffee or done me a bacon butty. But anyway, I married her eventually, but she was based in Norfolk, where I now live. Yeah, and I was based in London. So my and I was I was so poor. I was you know I was working as a journalist, but I was staying in bad hostel sort of hotels where you know there'd be a fire alarm and all these kind of half naked <laughs> men would come out of room. Oh, it's all. And so when yeah. I got home at the weekend, I was not, I was eating bad food and I was drinking badly. And when I came home at the weekend, she'd have a baby to present me she just wanted to go out and i just wanted to sleep yeah. so it couldn't last and then one day she contacted me and she said that, that there was this job available editing whiskey magazine but also three other magazines right as group editor so that so that's what started and i just happened to have the great michael jackson as a contributing editor and the great dave broom as a young contributing editor when was when this uh when was this taking place? When did that happen? Uh, um, mid nineties, wasn't it? No, Earlier. no. I, no I, I'm trying to think. Um, I'm trying to think of nine eleven. I seem to remember I was still down in Kent in at nine eleven. Right. So it would have been twenty years ago. It would have been late two thousand and eleven, or maybe early two thousand twelve. Nearly twenty years ago. Yeah. Had you any interest in whiskey before? No. None. No. <laughs> and what is it what is it that uh, obviously you, I, I know you're writing a lot about music and I know football is your other passion but music was your thing in terms of journalism. Uh and then to make the switch if you like to whiskey was was there any overlap in skills other than the journalism side? That's a that's an interesting question, really, because actually, it's it, it, your your analysis is actually not through any fault of your own. It's quite narrow because at the Sheffield Star, I volunteered to uh, when I went to Sheffield Star after university in eighty two, I offered to uh, cover heavy rock for the title because Sheffield was a big rock city, 
yeah. and there was a lot of rock music and nobody liked it. It wasn't cool. So I, I did that. Um, my day job, I was covering a really difficult period. I was covering, I was in Yorkshire for the miners' strike. Yeah. I went to picket line. I worked in Barnsley for six months and then Chesterfield for six months. And I went to the picket line every single day. That was my day job. Um, massively important as a journalist to do that. I mean, massive. That was the most real journalism I've ever done. I saw stuff that you just wouldn't believe. The Arthur really? Scargill days, wasn't it? I remember yeah, yeah. And, you seeing know, the images. But Arthur, but Arthur Scargill, Arthur Scargill was telling the truth. It's just he was brash. He was working class. He wasn't media trained, and he didn't know how to put over any form of image. But he was one hundred percent correct. I saw it happen. I ended up dating a girl in New Zealand. Uh, sorry, in uh, Sheffield, who the reason she came away for the weekend with me to my parents' house was because she lived in Mexborough, which is a small, tiny town near Doncaster. Mm. And the mine, we didn't have mobile phones. so the, 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 uh, Nobody had mobile phones then. So her phone would ring at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning telling her where the picket was that day because they trusted her. Yeah. And she went to the picket lines with them in the dark. And one time the police started doing what they used to do. They used to bang their truncheons on their uh, shields. Yeah, They charged and all the miners ran, and she tripped and got left behind, and the police started battening her. Right. And so the miners came back and rescued her, but she's Australian, and she was completely, completely and utterly thrown. I mean, mm. terrible. So they said, well, what were the police numbers? They've got numbers on there. She said, they didn't have any numbers. Of course mm. they did. They're the police. They've got to have numbers. They didn't have any numbers. We all know that now. They covered yeah. their numbers up. Anyway, I took her home to my family in Leicestershire just to get away from it all, and we ended up dating. So, so Arthur Scargill was telling an awful lot of truth. Um, it was an ugly, ugly, ugly time. But on the other side of it, I was writing about music as my passion, and I, I got a huge following in Sheffield because most rock fans are greasy-haired, acne, can't get a girlfriend, you know, um, into Dungeons and Dragons. That was yeah. me. That was me. So when I went to see Iron Maiden, I didn't tell them what they looked like because other reviewers said, you know, this is a concert for Spotty Head. I didn't do that. I said, this is just great compared to the last tour because the last tour's faults were X, Y, and Z. And this is absolutely on the button. And suddenly uh, they were get, we were getting letters at the Sheffield Star saying, You've got a guy who actually knows our music. And I'll never forget the day I was in a pub in Sheffield on my own, going to see some heavy metal band, and a group of leather-jacketed, long-haired kids turned around and said, are you going to the gig tonight, mate? And I said, yeah. I said, And they said, are you on your own? I said, yeah. And he said, do you want to join us? I said, no, that's all right. I said, okay. He said, what's your name? I said, Dom. And they said, you're not Dom Roscoe. <laughs> I said, I am. Fuck it out. Get the boy a drink. Good. Oh, sorry, I swore. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway, um... So, so that that was a whole different period. But my career was reporting news on daily newspapers, etc. It was only when I got to New Zealand and I was rubbish at being a New Zealand news journalist because I didn't understand what was news in New Zealand. You know, yeah. if a sheep farts in New Zealand, it's a story. You know, that's a, that's a bad bad. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I love New Zealand <laughs> so much, but you know, they'd, they'd have a they'd have a murder and it would last weeks. Be, yeah, and. People laughed at New Zealand because it had so little crime. Wow, that's fabulous. Yeah. You know, a country on the other side of the world that has this lovely, lovely people. So so I was rubbish at news over there. I couldn't, I couldn't get any story to save um, my life. So they moved me into music full time. And it was only when I came back from New Zealand that I needed a job. And I got a job in trade press. So what, the way that works is you run a pub. So we write a magazine or a, a newspaper and it's full of stories about the new releases, new products, what you could do, how you could put on Italian food in your pub, blah, blah. And we yeah. sell adverts to the advertisers. You get it free through your door, and we get money from the advertisers who want to get to you because you're running a pub. That's what I did. So, I mean, the north of England was, uh, you know, a hot pot, if you like, of music, and probably as a result of the social and economic difficulties that there were at the time, you know, uh, very much maybe, uh, uh, you know, as a result of, of, of those uh, difficulties, you know. Well, I'm talking to you in Ireland, and I don't know any 
country that knows that better than anybody than the Irish. But you're absolutely yeah. right. You, you, you know, um, I remember, I think it's in the film Educating Rita. Oh, yeah. And Michael Caine says something along the lines of, uh, I, I was writing bad poetry, so my wife left me. And Rita goes, really? He goes, yeah, but everything got a lot better. She said, really? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I stopped writing. Okay. And I had a, I had a, a Simon, I was talking to you before the show, but I was talking about a guy who's made a living out of the music industry. I remember him having his ex-girlfriend playing flute in my band and he was writing songs about her and he was inspired because it, you need, I mean, that's what the blues is. The blues is based on experience, you know, yeah. um, and the reality is that Ireland, all its creativity on the north of England, uh, Birmingham was a very, very rough industrial city that produced Black Sabbath and Judas Priest and yeah. a medieval white, dark sort of music. Sheffield, when I was there, produced Heaven 17, Human <laughs> League, ABC, yeah. Um, a band called Chack, which nobody's ever heard of, but that's because they only sold 16 <laughs> albums, but they bankrupted their record company, MCA, in the process because, <laughs> because they were so radically electronica. But this was music I hated. I, I you know, I wasn't in yeah. to electronic music, but I was a journalist, and my job was to report what was happening in Sheffield. And so I, you know, I, I knew all of those guys. Uh, there's a band called Living in a Box. They had a single called oh, yeah. Living in a Box. Um, um, Heaven 17's early stuff is very cabaret Volta. I seem to remember were Liverpudlian rather than Sheffield, but they had a huge sort of influence in Sheffield. Yeah. So there was that all sort of kind of um street uh electronica thing going on in Sheffield, as well as Saxon, Def Leppard, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden, all from Sheffield. Yeah, are you still into your music? Oh, absolutely, 100%. In fact, on my new website, uh, I just reviewed. The album's great. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, so don't ask me. But it's on the website. If you go to my website and look um, look up, uh, I don't know, what, 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 just click on the thing. You'll find there's this guy who's an American country rock singer, and every single song he sings has a whiskey reference. All right, he's okay. kind of living hard and dying hard. You know, He's one of these, you know, his single was Pour Whiskey on My Grave. It's right. all about don't 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 you know uh, don't be sad for me. Come and have a party on my grave and pour some whiskey on my grave. And and I I, I listen to this stuff. I'm I'm on every uh, free. I'm, well, I pay, but I'm, I access to Spotify and iTunes and all the rest of it. And I try. I really really. I buy three music magazines a month, and I try. Well, I tell you, I, I'm just a. Quick thing, I was going to write about it, and then I thought it's a bit difficult to be taken seriously when you're writing about a band I'm about to mention because they're so old and so not with it and so me, uh, and why would I write about them for a new generation? Yeah. But the new Cheap Trick album is just off the scale. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm massively into the uh, new Wolf Alice album, uh, which... The first two albums I wasn't too sure about. I felt they were a bit like NAS whiskey, non a staple whiskey, just not quite correct, not perfectly blended. They're too, a bit immature, too much going on, too many uh, conflicting notes. This third album is bang on the money. Yeah. Um, so, so, so you were critiquing music. I mean, you would have been critiquing the music as well. Then, I mean, yeah, obviously, totally. give, oh, of course. So, so you know, you get. I won't say you won't. You probably didn't get wined and dine at those events, but you know, you do probably at the whiskey ones. Uh, how do you objectively uh, critique something that you are entertained at? Yeah, very, very big and good question. You're quite good, actually, sir. Uh, sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I have my days. It's, it's midweek. Yeah, no. It's not the end of the week. No, no, it's a very good question. The truth is that um, that's why I say I'm not a journalist anymore. 
I, I did a, a long apprenticeship as a journalist. And, and to me, journalism is about two things. It's either going to a war zone and risking your life to get a story that the world needs to see without, without any luxury, no help. Or it's about what I did which is going to council meetings. Journal means daily. Yeah. And it's a daily record of normal people. I hated history because it was all about kings and queens or rebels. There was no 100 years war in three pages, please. You know, the, the way that we were taught about Irish history in this country is a disgrace. Nobody yeah. here cares about Ireland because nobody's ever been told what Ireland was to us and what we did there. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so I hated history. So journalism to me was about recording births, deaths, marriages, local council meetings, local magistrates' courts, and just reflecting a society. 50th wedding anniversary, you know, picture the yeah. couple and blah, blah. It's boring, it's dull. But what you also have to do is when a kid is run over on a street corner and he's, he's dead, you have to knock on the door of his parents, and you have to say, excuse me, I'm from the Sheffield Star. I'm really sorry for your loss. Can I talk to you about it? Wow. Now, you think about that. Yeah. I remember once I was standing outside a house shaking with fear because it's the worst thing I've ever had to do ever. And this Sheffield Star journalist by chance drove past, and he saw me, and he came in and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm meant to be doing a, a – it's called doorstepping. Yeah. I said, I meant to be doorstepping, but I feel terrible. And he said, Dominic, the day you don't feel terrible about doing that job is the day you leave the profession. Yeah. And and to me, those things are not what I do now, because you're quite right. I get wined and dined. Well, I don't actually very often. It, yeah. Actually, for me personally, it's not the truth at all. I uh, Most of the work I do, uh, I will say to a distillery in Spain, if I fly over and cover my own expenses, would you be willing to put me in a hotel, take me on a tour of your distillery, taste samples, and then we go to dinner? So you pay nothing more than bed and breakfast, basically, or dinner and breakfast. And then I'd come back and I'd sell it three ways. So I'd sell it to different outlets, and I'd make a £1,000. But that distillery didn't pay anything beyond the dinner and uh, it could be 50 quid yeah but they also got to know me and they also got to realize that i was actually quite honest and sincere and they got lots of publicity for very little return so yeah. i've grown that throughout my career so um so for me personally i i tend to i was a bit taken out i was reading i should never have done it i was reading some comments about an interview i did with all things whiskey and mm -hmm. some of it was really personal, really, really nasty. Um, mm -hmm. And totally unwarranted. And one of them was, yeah, but, you know, basically it's in his interest to make sure the industry is successful because that's how he makes his living. Actually, I make my living from, or oh, I did make my living from having outlets like yours that would publish stuff. Yeah. So they didn't pay me. So, but if you go on a press trip with Diageo, um, and you get the full works, or Puerto Rico, or Edrington, I'm not bad-mouthing Diageo in any way, then it's hard. But what I would say is this, that we work in a very, very uh, successful, happy, and um, high-quality industry. So it's easy to find feel-good stories. Yeah, What you can't do is become part of the establishment and i could name names now that i feel really recently really recently uh there's a i think that what i call the edinburgh mafia mm -hmm. posh scots they're they're the they treat me with disdain they don't like me they they don't see me part of their club yeah but you know what do you feel do you feel uh hurt by that oh no 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 not at all no 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 i I think it's I, I I think it's difficult because you don't want to be you you called me outspoken at the beginning of the interview. I don't want to um, go to war with anyone. I did when I was ill, but 
I uh, now I all my tweets are positive, all my Facebook messages are positive. I like lots of other people's stuff. I try and support what I believe in, and I don't get involved with the negativity stuff because it's a hiding to nothing. You know, establishments are establishments because they've done it for generations. The royal yeah. family is what it is because it's done it for centuries. Yeah, you coming along and signs up, fight your fists at it, it ain't gonna work. Um, Can we go back to, um, I suppose, your first uh, job as editing then in uh, well, whiskey magazine? I think you worked for Whiskeria, you worked for Whiskey Quarterly, uh, uh, a whole load of them. Uh, obviously, you started with Whiskey Magazine, hugely successful worldwide. We know, you know, they were the the gold standard, or possibly still are. And uh, what was that like in the early days? Um, well, I, w w well, it depends what you mean by the early days. You mean the early days, of the magazine, cause I wasn't there in the early days, of the magazine. Well, no, when you started, when you started, uh, it, it, it was just amazing. It was just yeah. amazing because, um, I had no idea, absolutely no idea that I would, uh, fall in love with a drink that went back in the sixties. My mum let me drop, put her, my finger in her whiskey. And lick it, and and she smoked back then. She gave up many, many, many years ago. Um, but I remember the comfort of this PT whiskey and the smoke from my mother. And I suppose it was a Johnny Walker because I, it wouldn't have been a single malt back in the sixties. Yeah. So I assume it was Johnny Walker because that's what Dad drank, and so I assume Mum did too. But anyway, I. Grew up, our generation grew up uh, drinking vodka and lime, if any spirits at all, or rum and black. Oh, yeah, black Russian. No, yeah, 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 yeah. A Smurf, Smurf did a, a mixer called Russian, I think, and it was yeah. pink. Colored. But I rarely drank spirits, full stop. I was a beer man. Uh, and then when I went to New Zealand, I, I moved in cider. And no, sorry, I didn't. I drank beer in New Zealand. Then I came back to London and the beer was crap. And yeah. too often I was drinking crap beer, so I started drinking strong beer and I became a side drinker. But that's another story entirely. The thing about um, about all of that period was that I just didn't know the product. So I had no idea that there was this world. And you know what? As a journalist, you know, I, I spent very, very little time in Japan. And I've got a book called Whiskey Japan. And people say, well, how could you write a book about Japan if you didn't really go there very much? Yeah, yeah it's simple. I'm a journalist. I talk to people who did. You yeah. know, I could take any subject and interview people who are relevant to it and take their information and present it. That's what journalism is. So in the early days with whiskey, I just found it – I just couldn't believe how exciting it was. I couldn't believe that, firstly, this guy, Michael Jackson – and if anybody has any recollection of him, he was a uh, very like a, a little sparrow, like like a little mouse. Yeah. And he he didn't give himself up very easily. And then there's Dave Broom, who's a rock star, you know, and with the same tastes and same attitude to journalism as me, which means uh, Hunter S. Thompson and Gonzo journalism. Because you're not meant to put as a journalist, you're meant to be an observer. You're not meant to be in the story. Yeah. But Hunter S. Thompson and all those Gonzai journalists and um, the guy, who, uh, Bukowski, all these guys, they put themselves into the story. Lester Bangs is another one. They put themselves into the story. And uh, Dave did that. And from yeah, Dave very much Warren, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just I, – and, you know, the most important moment in my entire career probably was going to the recreation of the McAllen 1842 replica on my right. first day. So you get there, everybody's there. The whole room is full of the top whiskey writers in the whole world. No, no, in the whole world. Certainly in Britain. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I don't know about this job, but, you know, still. And the guy who presented it was Dave Robertson from McAllen at the time. He's now Rare 101. Mm -hmm. But Dave is six years or five, six years younger than me. And he's the master distiller at McAllen. And I thought, do you know what? This is really not what I thought it would be like. And so Dave and I have become best friends. And then to end the, the, the comment, 
Then I started traveling up to Scotland. And for some reason, these people who are total geniuses at what they do were flattered by the fact I had come to see them and, and treated me like I was special. And I wasn't special at all. I was... I always describe it as like being that little fish on the back of the great white shark that nibbles yeah. the skin. And the shark doesn't mind because it gets, stops the skin getting covered with stuff. It gets cleaned, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it gets cleaned. But the little fish travels on the back of the great white shark, totally safe from anything because there's nobody going to come and get him. That's what I think I am. I think, I, well, I think we are, as a profession, the little fish that are – eating off the back of a great white shark industry and w they turn around and give us the praise for it bizarre yeah yeah i mean there's not many industries like that but uh you know you, you probably started before the frenzy on whiskey really took off i mean when did you start seeing this uh obsession with whiskey from people really start to take off dominic and and I suppose it would have been Scotch initially. So when, when did you see that really start taking off? I'm not sure it was Scotch initially. I, what, what I'd say about this is there's two parts to this. First yeah. is that if you were me, my drink was uh, rum and black and vodka and lime, and we talked about that. For my son, normally somebody in their mid-20s, my son's the eldest son's 23, my... People in their mid-20s, their fathers didn't drink whiskey. Yeah. Their grandfathers did. So they discovered it for themselves through the internet. I wouldn't like to be going back into the realms of trying to tell somebody what to think about in a book because the yeah. book is six months out of date by the time it appears because of the publication schedules. And, yes, it's lovely to have a coffee table book that looks great on its coffee table, but – their information sources were each other. And so educated 20-something-year-old people, in, quite early on, actually, this would have happened um, early 2000s, I would have thought. Yeah. But I still don't know what triggered it. But for me personally, when I left Whiskey Magazine, I absolutely decided that my thing would be New World Whiskey and I would go – Anywhere I could get a plane flight to write about whiskey. And Swede, uh, and, and people just, I mean, my mother wouldn't taste Japanese whiskey because she was from a generation that remembers the war. Right. And okay, I was born yeah. only 16 years after the end of the Second World War. So it's very, very, and we had comics where you had, you know, Japanese suicide pilots with white bands with a red star going banzai banzai it's just incredible to think we we were reading as children such racist yeah. appalling stuff but that's because it was all so fresh so by um the 2000s japanese whiskey suddenly just took off it took off not because of me it took off because of dave broom michael jackson and march and miller primarily yeah. And we launched well, Whiskey Magazine, it's before my time, launched Whiskey Live Japan, and they just would fight to get on the flight, so I never went. Yeah. So I didn't have that great connection with – but when I went freelance, I thought, well, hang on. If you can do it with Japanese whiskey, why don't we try and start discovering different flavors in different countries? And that's what I started doing. So – and at the time – and this is why the Australians are so loyal to me and, and – Patrick Zweedham at uh, Millstone is so loyal to me because nobody saw it then. Same with bourbon. Nobody even saw it, let alone – so now it, it, it seems it's changed, but it happened really, really fast. And they were, Master and Malt did a great job. Whiskey Exchange did a great job. They were bringing whiskey in and just saying, stop comparing it to scotch. Let's Let's – Take it for where it is. I remember giving a shocking review to an Australian whiskey in 2005. It was dreadful. Yeah. But, I mean, but comparing – and this is one of the difficulties, I think. You know, I mean, obviously, World Whiskey, you were one of the first proponents of it, and I think you certainly put it on, on the stage. But comparing World Whiskey to Scotch is, is a dangerous game and, and maybe an unfair game as well because – Either you match what the Scotch are doing and you compete at that level or you reinvent what whiskey is. And I think, you know, 
bourbon, you know, Irish, Australian, yeah. Swedish, Danish, all the rest, French. They're they're not trying to mimic necessarily what Scotch is because you're competing against people that have been doing it for so long that uh, it's a different playing field. But what you've brought out is what those other playing fields are. So how do you deal with making any comparisons or not even making comparisons, but judging world whiskey to what you've grown up with? No, I'm even not grown up with, but what you're used to having worked with. The way I look at it is this: that's that is an, an, another great question. It's, it's quite encompassing, but but the way I look at it is this: that uh, if you like Indian food, you say, right, shall we have a takeaway tonight? And the answer might be, well, we only had one yesterday. Yeah. Well, Indians eat it every single day. The reason. For that is within the category of Indian with uh, sorry Indian food are everything from very very light sweet coconutty meals to heavily vindaloo-esque pile curry extremes and they're totally different foods and it's exactly where I am with whiskey that my view is that I have had the best judging panel for world whiskey awards because even before I launched them the people here in Norfolk that I used to come to my tasting groups. Um, There's I'm an interesting reading, comment from Frank. Yeah, can you read it out after this? Because uh, I, I yeah, absolutely, yeah. But but um, no. Um, the point is that uh, so my judges have been with me for twenty years, and they're not going into an event where you get loads of wine and then vodka and then gin, and then you get Scotch whiskey, and then you compare world whiskey to Scotch whiskey. It doesn't compare. It shouldn't compare. S Swedish whiskey, uh, uh, a lot of the um, peat comes from under the Baltic Sea, so it's salty. But what the Swedes do in winter is they preserve their foods with salt. So the yeah. salty taste is very natural to a Swedish palate. It's the same with juniper twigs. They burn juniper to smoke food. So they use that for whiskey. It's a different flavor to Scotland. Australia, peat in Australia is very, very different. Oak in many, many countries is very, very different. Uh, and so they get used, th th these countries get used to their flavors. They don't want to be Scotch. And yeah. you're quite right. Irish whiskey and bourbon, I've always said this, you either copy Scotland, and if you do, good luck because they're years ahead. Or you do something totally different, like the Irish and, and and the Americans have. And increasingly, I think we're at a very, very early stage of the evolution of flavors. I think we, we, we're decades away. Yeah. So, so I had no problem with any of that. I just told my judges, look, we're doing a tasting tonight. It's all going to be European whiskey. And some of it was foul back then. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, if I put a spirit of a ven from Sweden in front of my judges, blind, they'll yeah. all say that that spirit of a ven. You're talking about the uh, the Wizard of Whiskey Awards that you set up. Is this, is, are they the judges you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's another reason. That's another reason why I cancelled it, really, because we got to the point where my judges were so far ahead of the game. It wasn't a competition anymore because they just knew that was spirit of a then they liked it. Yeah. And so unless I changed the judges, and I don't think I'd ever found judges with as much knowledge. Don't believe they exist. Jim Murray arguably, arguably is on the level with my judges. But really, when it comes to world whiskey, we've been doing a long, long time. Yeah. I mean your book your book uh on on the world whiskey 750 whiskies from around the world obviously that's a a huge success that book uh, i know you you've kind of dismissed the idea of updating it or doing a new version of it uh, and what's the reason behind that dominic no i didn't no you you might do it well well put, put it this way since that first issue, you, you talk about uh, 750 of the world best yeah. whiskies. Yeah. Firstly, the first thing they did was they published it in nine languages. So I've got copies in my garage in Russian, Chinese, Spanish, 
Italian, French. It's amazing. Yeah, you yeah. really. It's nothing like seeing your name in Chinese. Um, <laughs> well, I know but, you've been learning French over the COVID period. Oh, I've been learning French a long, long more time than that. Have you? But yeah. I've just. Oh, I'm on 460 consecutive days. I did it just before I came on to you tonight because I've had quite a busy day today. So I normally do it in the morning if I can, just to get it out of the way because then I might forget. But 460 days consecutive, and I pretty much think that if you looked up the length of the pandemic, that's where it's them yeah. from. But yeah. I have been a member. I have been a member since 2014. So, right. but but to go back to back to the point, Serge. The the, the, the thing is that. Um, that I, I did update that book once yeah. and then they put out a paperback version of it. And, but the problem is with publishing now is that, so I just updated a thousand and one whiskeys. Yeah. And they say, right, we'll pay you to update X number. Right. But the number means, so there's two things wrong with that the number means that you have to make very very harsh decisions about what to take out and leave in because some of the stuff left in shouldn't be still there because it could have been limited edition it could have been car strength uh, single cast whatever this is but, the 1001 whiskies before you die is it yeah yeah so so this september october you know what they do with that book is um that's been going for nearly 20 years, that, that, that 1001 concept. Yeah. And they do two books a year. So they've done wine, beer, whiskey, cars, football yeah. stadiums. You, got, you, you name it, they've done it. Yeah. And what they do is they do one every six months. So they force you to meet a very strict deadline. The original book nearly killed me. I mean, it really nearly killed me. I was passing out on the sofa every night, waking up and starting work again. Uh, I was badly let down by some of my writers, so I had to cover for them because there weren't enough entries. And yeah. then <laughs> I finished on December the 22nd. And then on Christmas Day, one of my friends gave me a 1,001 albums to try before you die. Oh, and I've never even picked it up. I just I've couldn't seen that, yeah. I've I couldn't even that. look at it. But uh, but um, so there's two problems with that. One is the number they want to replace doesn't really justify the uh, strap line fully revised. So it'll be appear in September, October, all over the world, saying yeah. updated and revised. And it is. Yeah. But not by 500 whiskeys. Yeah. And secondly, um, nobody talks about this, but it's the elephant in the room. If you go back to Michael Jackson book, and he's reviewed Bowmore 12, Mm -hmm. He would have done that in 1986, 87, I don't know. So we leave that in because it's Beaumont 12, it's standard expression. We've got to bring in new expressions. We've got lots of things to write about. But the whiskey in the glass that you're going to drink tonight is not the 1996. No, I mean, that's, that's a really big point, you know, and, and I see that with – you know, with a lot of different expressions of, of whiskey, you know, it's a standard release, but inevitably uh, and undoubtedly they have changed over the time. Like, of I mean, course. look at the Art Big Ten, or, you know, that's just an, you know, Irish expressions do the same thing. They change over time. Um, and look, does that mean you go back and judge them again from scratch? You should do. Yeah, you should. But the bottom line is this that. At the end of the day, it's my job. Yeah. So unless the um, publishers are saying, right, well, you can do what you like and we'll pay you whatever you want, and you get paid £20 a review or whatever it is, but yeah. they don't. They say yeah. we want 100 new uh, reviews, 200 new reviews, and we'll pay you whatever that is. Yeah. And so the book is impure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 I suppose I shouldn't really say this because what I'm actually doing is say, don't buy my new book. But there are new whiskies in it. The great thing for me is that the one thing I will do with the Michael Jackson book is all my entries will be New World. Yes. And increasingly, yes. you know, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but when I first got asked to do the Michael Jackson book, 
there were 40 pages of McCallan in the Malt Whiskey Companion. There right. were 40 pages of McCallan, and I said, I just won't touch them. I'm going to leave them there. When Leonard Skinner's singer got killed, they used to come on and play Freebird and just put a light on the microphone oh, and right. no singer, right? And that was my equivalent. Um, yeah. We'll leave Michael Jackson's McCallan. He loved McCallan. So we'll leave it absolutely unchanged, even though a lot of it was no longer available. But when we came to do the next one, we slashed 30 something pages off it because they weren't available anymore. Why, why, why the interest in world whiskies? And what do you do? Actually, maybe more fundamentally, what do you define world whiskey as? I mean, is it French, German, Swedish, Australian, Japanese? Oh, Japanese, probably not. Or, or is New World whiskey, can there be Scotch New World whiskies? Yes. Um, I think the big thing about my new issue of uh, Stills Crazy is that Jim Swan single-handedly has changed two things for me in, in my attitude to whiskey. One is that in the past I had New World yeah, and I had Old World. And Old World was the five territories I mentioned, so Scotland, Ireland, Canada, Japan, and Kentucky. Yeah. But and everything else was fair game for New World. But Jim Swan, so the first thing Jim Swan did was to say, well, hang on, we've got all these distilleries in Scotland who are small, independent. They're not part of Diageo, the Jim Swan's distilleries. Why should they not be part of a new world of whiskey? Yeah. So, therefore, in my magazine, you'll see Lindora's Abbey, you'll see Nuckneen. Um uh, and I'm going back to other distilleries, the next two issues. Um, and the second thing that happened was um, the ba basically, um, I'm trying to think what my second point is. Oh, yeah. So basically, Jim Swan defined all those whiskies by um, – certain production methods that were quite revolutionary. Some Scottish distilleries don't like them, and that's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But they they just are innovative and progressive. So for me, they have absolutely every much value as somebody in Finland or, or, or Taiwan or Australia. So um, – and Australia – sorry, Ireland's full of them. Ireland's got so many great distilleries. Yeah. And most of them are independent. I would not most, but outside Puerto Rico, there are a lot of independent distillery projects. Yeah. So they, I've redefined my term for New World whiskies. For me, I also call the magazine Pot Still for a reason. Pot, sorry. It's, still crazy. Still's crazy. The reason I call it that is because... I want to be able to write about – I was talking to a guy in Belgium the other day, uh, and he does do whiskey, but his main thing is Geneva. Right. Well, I find that an interesting category, and the magazine is about distilling, so why shouldn't I write about interesting other spirits? And there's a fine line between matured gins and matured Genevas and whiskey. It's a very fine line. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to exploring all of that. Yeah, I mean, you have you have done writing on beers and other spirits as well. Yes. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of books there. I mean, how many books have you done? I've got a list of them here because there were too many for me to. So you've got uh, Whiskey Japan, the world's best whiskies, yeah, Whiskey America, the seven moods of craft spirits, uh, a thousand and one whiskies to try before you die, Whiskey Opus. The whiskey book, I think that was with Gavin Smith. Uh, whiskey malt whiskies of Scotland. Uh, need to know whiskies from confused to connoisseur. What to drink next? Craft whiskies, classic flavors, new distilleries, future trends. Uh, I mean, that's quite prolific in your. I mean, when you sit down, I mean, you you mentioned a couple of the the issues you had there about publishing. But when you sit down and you you decide you're going to do a book, what's your objective and what drives you to do one? And then after that, 
what would you change about publishing the way it stands at the moment okay so firstly normally i do have an agent but she was michael jackson's agent and she's very old and i get it's funny because i yeah it happened last week actually i i get a handwritten letter from her and i open it up and it's a check it's a royalty check and loads of papers explaining why i've got the amount i've got and yeah. she takes 10 percent off it because that's her fee and um and it's all very quaint but it's a lovely surprise because when you're sitting there at home not doing anything and 600 pounds turns up in the post that you have no idea was coming or whatever it is um yeah. But you don't choose your books. The reality is, normally they contact you and they say, we need a book on X, we're going to update Y. Would you be available to do it? And that's what's happened with the Michael Jackson Malt Whiskey Companion. They've contacted us and said, if we were to do it next year, and I know exactly how this works. Publishers are ruthless. They'll... they'll, they'll not give you any help whatsoever and then suddenly impose massive deadline on you but i can almost certainly tell you that the book will have to be finished by march for publication in september so they decide tighten up yeah and you can choose to say yes or no and of course and the worst of it is any writer who's desperate to, and i did it who wants to establish themselves will take a book for nothing you know, if they say, here's a couple of thousand pounds to do a book, would you do it? You're going to think, wow, credibility. I'm lucky yeah. I've got three books on royalties, but that's not normal anymore. Normally what happens is they contact you and say, we're, do we're looking to do a whiskey book. We're looking for an author. What do you think? And you say, yes, I'd be interested. And they say, we're thinking of doing this. What are your thoughts? And then you send some thoughts. And eventually they say, here's the deal we would want all the copy by december it would be delivered in three batches the total fee is ten thousand pounds and it would be paid in three installments on completion of each deadline and you say yes okay then they send a huge legal document you sign it and that ten thousand pounds is it yeah. yeah with royalties what happens is they send you ten thousand pounds in advance so everything the book earns in the first few months pays off the 10,000 they've lent you. But yeah. as soon as it goes into the black, you get 10% of every profit made. Right. Okay. So, so it, it, and, and to be honest, I absolutely love writing books, but I, before the pandemic and when I was not in a great place, I, um, did three books back to back. And I the irony was I actually had the same editor for two of the books. Right. Okay. So I was sending, sending in stuff and saying, I'm really, really sorry. Um, this is late, but I've been pressed on something else. But the something else was the same company. Well, I hope you weren't giving the same reason for both of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, otherwise you'd be well caught up. I mean Personally, you know, I'm speaking from a biased point of view, and, and maybe your answer might be as well. Are books even relevant anymore? You know, are magazines um, are magazines relevant anymore? Who cares? I mean, you know, uh, is it something that people are interested in anymore? Yes. Yeah, big yes. And I'll tell yeah. you why. Because last week, uh, vinyl sales of uh, albums overtook oh, yeah. CD sales. So if you want to listen to, and I do a lot of downloading stuff, you want to listen to the new album by, I don't know, uh, Wolf Alice, um, I pay a subscription thing so I can download it on Friday morning when it's released, and the quality is fine for me. Yeah. But if I wanted to start, you know, if I was single and I had loads of space and was allowed to do such things, and I wanted to start a collection of Deep Purple, Rainbow, and Richie Blackmore albums on oh. vinyl, I could do Ask that. fortune. Too. <laughs> it would cost you a fortune now to do it. It would cost you a fortune because they're bloody expensive. But that's mm. the point. It's all to do with demand and supply. So the question is, you know, uh, there are things that I would want to see online. But, you know, if my wife goes out to a shop 
and uh, she can bring you back a Guardian, a newspaper. I still get printed newspaper. Very rare because I live in the middle of nowhere. My wife doesn't rarely do anything for me. But the bottom line is that um, the, the bottom line is that that's the format I would enjoy. I I subscribe to online Independent Guardian and Sunday Times, and BBC. And in the morning when I wake up, I will flick through the headlines on those formats without a doubt. But I out of sight is out of mind. You know, I I want to get the culture section from the Sunday Times and look up albums and yeah. see you know what, how things are doing. So. I think it's true. I think it's exactly true with magazines and books. I think that the feel having a coffee table book or a authoritative magazine still has a place. It can't compete. The, uh, certainly, a book can't. A book can't compete because it's the, the speed of our industry, speed of the world. Yeah, is so so fast now that you know. But. My magazine online, I've got the best of both worlds because it's online and I, I and I can do what I want with it. But you'll notice there's an awful lot of pretty National Geographic-like photos. And I wanted to create a magazine that reflected the world of whiskey around the world by having geographical pictures, not stills, not brown and gold and orange, but bright and vibrant and tree and tel aviv there's a beach on this feature of milk and holly honey of the beach in tel aviv that i want people to go on that journey in lockdown when they can't so i think there's a definite value in it yeah i think there's definitely a value in print but i mean you certainly got the creative side on in the like we're talking about the the digital issue that you have and and the hugely artistic part of that and i think you know that makes it stand out as as well as the uh, the hugely uh, interesting articles in it. But I mean, you download that's a free download available. I've just put the link in the uh, in the comments here if anybody wants to go and have a look at it. But certainly, really interesting, well worth looking, and very fresh, fresh. But it has that uh, psychedelic rock seventies kind of look to it as well, which I, I really like. So it stands out. Yeah, I, I'm not even sure where I found Ollie. He always says, don't put my name anywhere because I like to be in the background. But this guy's down in Western Supermare. Yeah. And I found him. I must have found him through a freelance whiskey site. I don't know. Freelance design site. Yeah. Anyway, I've never met him. I've only spoken to him online, Zoom. But he just gets it. He just gets me absolutely from day one. The only, the only, so the first time he sent me the uh, home page for the website, which is the pink page with all the faces on it. Yeah. Uh, it was a little bit old and white, and I wanted more ethnicity and a little bit more freakery, to be honest. And he then delivered it. But apart from that, he's everything he does. I just look at it and I think, wow, it's just so brilliant. And the reference you just made, I, I'll tell you how I feel. This is the most creative I've been in six to eight years, definitely. Yeah. And the reason for it is, is because, one, he gets it absolutely. Ollie just gets it. But secondly, he went, towards the end of his life, Johnny Cash uh, teamed up with that guy, guy from Run DMC, the producer oh, yeah. of uh, hip-hop and rap. And this... And he's done, and on that particular, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. I should do. It's really bad. But that producer um, has uh, he did Run DMC, he did Beastie Boys, and he's done other aging artists since. Mm -hmm. And what it brings out of them is all that creativity that's still there, and he shakes it up and makes it fresh. And um, I just feel like I'm having. Uh, There's a name, Rick Robin. Yeah, Rick Rubin. Rubin. Rick Rubin, even. Yeah, yeah that's him. Yeah. That guy brought so many old codgers. Tom Jones, he did the Tom Jones album. He, you know, these guys are really talented. Tom Jones and, and um, uh, Johnny Cash, massively talented, but they were out of their time. So he brought them into their time and showed them off. And that's how I feel. I feel I'm getting a lot of praise. I've had an amazing day because the response has been immense. Yeah. But it's not really down to me because I don't believe most of the people are commenting on the look of it. I've read it yet. 
because there's a lot of reading. There's, there's a, a lot, lot of reading in it, definitely. Yeah. 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 It's... So really, it's not really about me. It's about Ollie. But wow, what a great place to be. You know, mm. and Ollie's really happy. He's, he's got he, – he does lots of design work for companies, and it's all kind of – uh, oh, it would be yeah. mundane corporate kind of yeah, stuff, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and discussing with them whether they want to use an exclamation mark because it makes it sound powerful or not. And then I give them free reign to go and rock and roll with my stuff and say, look, you can't be too crazy for Dom. Yeah. And every time he sends me stuff, and he hates sending me stuff in bits, he loves just oh, waiting, yeah. and waiting and sending it as a complete thing. And also, it's 68 pages. I, yeah. I pay him to do me a 40 page magazine, but he loves it. He just loves it. Yeah, and I yeah. love having the work with him. I, it's just amazing fun. We're, well, I, I'm going to brief him tomorrow for issue three. We're not yeah. meant to be publishing issue two until July, and we're already out. Yeah. But he, but I'm just flowing with it. While we're, um, while we're productive and while we're uh, on a roll, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to flow the ideas for the cover and say, you know, this is your next thing. Think about cover three. But I know the content absolutely already. So, Well, I mean, but, the passion the passion that you have for it uh, comes through, you know, and I think he he kind of interprets that fantastically well. So well done on that. Uh, and I'm well, looking looking forward to read this one. Like I said, I, I, I've... I haven't read any of it, but obviously it only came no, out today, no, so no, I'm not going to pretend I have. Also, and but, also, uh, you know, I, I mean, the thing is that we've, I mean, we've discussed this before, you know, is it a magazine or is it a kind of an internet posting? This has got a lot of reading in it. And if people don't want to read it, that's fine. But as long yeah. as it makes an impact and the people, you know, the people in Mass are the people who knew Jim really well. So, mm -hmm. The comments I've received online from Dan Zor at Cotswolds Distillery and Stephen Davis, particularly at um, Penderen, you know, these yeah. people knew the guy and his daughter really, really touched. And, and after that, you know, if people don't read, it doesn't matter. As long as it looks good and, and, and it's been accepted, people say, oh, Dom's still around then. And, and, and look, he's doing flashy stuff. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. Tell me, go back. To, let's go back to the beginning just briefly, because we we talked about you getting into whiskey, but we didn't talk about what was it that fascinated you. What got you hooked? What was the the draw, and what is that still is the draw for you about whiskey? Um, I think that's a really good question. I think it's probably that um, it's a weird industry. So, so you have a drink that is made in the valleys of the highlands with a whole load of history of people being driven out by the British and, and 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 you've got this kind of industry that's in 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 the highlands and they're making a drink and it was always for their communities and then they used to use it for currency uh, uh and it grew the way it did and then the british the, sorry the english came in with tax and all that stuff but it's reached the point that this week I, and i won't even reply to the email i'm not interested I think Gordon McPhail have just put out an 80-year-old whiskey this week, mm. I think. And the price per bottle is absolutely obscene. Yeah. I mean, it's obscene. And these guys who make it just shake their heads and say, what's that about? Yeah, what's that about? It's a liquid. It's a drink. You drink it. And what's going on there? So when I started going to Scotland, and I had such great support from Dave Brim and from Michael Jackson, and then I started going to Scotland and meeting these guys who were so humble but so incredibly talented. If you want a taste of it these days, go to the uh, VIP tour at Balvenie because right. you'll be in a small group. You'll only be allowed a group of maybe eight people, I think. I don't know, small group. It's a bit like the Glengoyne one, then small and. Is that what Glengoyne's like? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's very intimate. Yeah, and and 
the well, VIP was. Was, the VIP one at Belveni lasts like four or five hours. And you start in the uh, lodge, the little lodge, and you have a cup of coffee. And he sounds the people, the people who run it, sound the group out to find out their level of knowledge over a cup of coffee. You don't know it's being done, but effectively they're profiling, so they know where to pitch the tour. Yeah, and then you go on the tour, and it's it's just remarkable. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm looking like I'm doing something odd down here. I'll show you what it is. <laughs> I don't want to. It's my dog. All ah, right. Okay. It, it's my it's my gorgeous puppy. Uh, Milo, I'm I'm working. <laughs> How, yeah. How's his English? Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um, and then you end up back at uh, this Porter's Lodge, <laughs> and they pretty much let you taste whatever you want from Balvenie. And it there was one particular. I've done it about four times. I love it. It's the best tour. But the guy who will take you probably worked in the distillery 50 years and then you get a sense of what these people are so here comes dom with his 10 years experience or five years experience or one week's experience and this guy is talking to you and he is your servant because you, you you're you're effectively employing him and he's a genius yeah. just remarkable so i think that's the thing that always got me uh, I, I think the n amount of great people. Do you know? Do you know? I'm going to tell you. I'm I'm a Republican. Mm -hmm. I'm no uh, royalist in any way. But Prince Charles understands this. When Prince Charles comes to to a distillery, he is very uneasy around suits. But the further into the warehouse he goes, and the lower he meets people who work there, the more relaxed naturally he is. And that's yeah. a fact. And he. Um, understands that these guys have all this knowledge but no pretension and so they pay pay humble pride to, humble pride to him but he learns from them that's what i love that's the yeah. thing that got me and it gets better the other thing is ireland's amazing i only had one bad experience in ireland and it was a mistake <laughs> well <laughs> we won't talk about that there, there can't be many stuff. It's, a, it's another story, but the guys have spent the rest of the last five years apologizing. Um, right. And it's to do with the book. Uh, I'll tell you what it's to do with very quickly. I I was writing The World's Best Whiskies, and I always end up with any uh, whiskey book in Ireland because I always have such a crack and such a great time. And so I arranged to go over to see uh, the three distillers uh, from Middleton and Bushnells. And... Um, they were really off with me, really, really off. They didn't offer me a drink, not even a whiskey, nothing. And they were really, really off with me. And then the book came out, and uh, Irish Distillers launched uh, the um, three first pot still whiskies they did, which, if I remember correctly, were Middleton, John's Lane, Oh uh, yeah, Powers John's Lane, yeah. Powers John's Lane. Yeah, the three powers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. were there were three releases. Anyway, they'd been told that this journalist was trying to come and get information on the new releases, and they were absolutely sworn to secrecy because it was embargoed until September. I was there to write a book that wasn't even coming out until that time. But right. as a result of that, they felt they couldn't even have a drink with me because they didn't trust themselves to not give away information. They shouldn't. And yeah. so they were really, really cruel to me. I'm not cruel, just very cold. Yeah. And I was yeah. so upset. And then it all came out years later that they thought I was after the exclusive story on these three whiskeys, yeah. and I wasn't. And I spent forever apologizing for it. But great great people and then you go around the world and you realize that actually and i'm an international socialist so i love the fact that i can treat uh, a german exactly the same as i would treat uh, an irishman or an australian i i just i just love that and i find that all the people in the industry are very similar it's like yeah. being in a big family yeah well i mean um, the language is so similar i suppose and that's it immediate unity but you know you, you you've traveled well obviously not over the last year but you have traveled extensively all over the world and 
you've tried whiskey from all over the world, obviously. Uh, what are the standout ones at the moment, other than Irish, which we'll come and talk about separately, but uh, what are the standout countries at the moment for you uh, or the standout distilleries uh, worldwide at the moment? Oh, that's, that's golly. I, I, Too many? I, I, well, I would say it's not even like trying to choose your favourite child. It's like trying to choose your favourite great, great, great child. There's so many. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I love what's happening in Australia. The, you know, the first issue of my magazine looked at uh, the Master of Malts uh, releases from Australia, the, the next wave, you know. Uh, yeah. Christy Lark, Christy Lark and Lewis Lark. Sorry, Bill, Bill's son is not Lewis. Can't remember his name, but... Um, but they're another generation. They're in their 20s, you know, and they're, they're yeah. bringing whiskies to another level. And all of those whiskies are great. And I'm looking forward to exploring a lot, lot more. Um, Sweden never fails to disappoint. It's just amazing. Some great, great stuff. Some of the stuff that's in Ireland is just great. Some of the stuff that's in America. America's difficult because there's some real rubbish. And yeah. you have to really know how to separate the wheat from the chaff excuse the pun um but when it's done well american whiskey can be great so it's hard i'm looking forward to uh i i like the innovation in the alpine countries i've been banging the drum for the alpine countries in the last two years i work for one yeah um i um i'm really looking forward to issue four where i test my french knowledge and write a, a letter to the my French distillers telling them that they can answer in French and I can deal with that and uh, getting to terms with France. Because when, when I started writing about France, there were four distilleries. I think there's 20 something now at least. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I think there's more in France now than there are in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. It's just incredible. Yeah. So, but the great thing is, from my point of view, you know, is that um, I'm not going to run out of space run out of ideas so yeah i think we all have that kind of problem well not a problem that that opportunity there's so much to write about now it's uh phenomenal but i, I want to take you back there and, and just question you, you mentioned there are some rubbish whiskies in the states uh, obviously there are some really good ones as well uh, like like i imagine anywhere uh how do you define two things a quality whiskey and a good whiskey because I mean, a poor quality whiskey can have a good taste. I would argue. A what whiskey can't? A, a poor quality whiskey, I would argue, could actually have a good taste. Yeah, this is a really difficult area because one of the things I like to say a lot is that I really don't think I'm an expert. I think that I practice a lot, and I think I get to know. And the analogy I use, and I'm sorry if people have heard it a hundred times, is that if you put me in a, a shed with a guitar for eight years, I'll be a really good guitarist, but I won't be Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. And and so I'm practiced, and I know, and even when my palate's been struggling, I still think I, I have an advantage over loads of people. And I'm at the moment, I'm doing a lot of consultancy work. So a lot of the work I do is actually tasting whiskey for people who are yeah. tasting it as well. And it's amazing how on par things are. So I'm quite comfortable, but I do worry about it because I think uh, you can lose that ability. Um, but the other big expression I use a lot, and I'm going to have to, I could change it just to be slightly different. But um, taste is subjective up to a point. So when you taste a good whiskey, you're judging it on things like balance, consistency, uh, mouth delivery, all those sort of things. Yeah. And there's no such thing as a good tasting bad whiskey. To me... You know, if I get a whiskey and it's three years old, four years old, and it's all serially and immature, then 
it can't you can't judge it as a good whiskey and it's really important to the conversation we've been having because jim swan has made great whiskey at four years old and countries like india and taiwan and australia can make good whiskies at four years old so and england actually so um so age is kind of only one of the many variants humidity heat uh sure. pressure all of those things are variants um but what I'd say is that everyone has their own taste. So if somebody tastes whiskey and says that's really, really great, fine. So your choice. But my other cliche comment is I'm, I've got to start, stop using it. But what I say is like, if you like raw chicken, sorry, if you like uh, roasted chicken and I like fried chicken, that's fine. They're different chickens. But raw chicken is just wrong. So yeah. to me... I'm very cynical about any Scotch whiskey under 10 years because I think it needs that much maturity to reach the level of uh, acceptability. Yeah. Whereas India, Cotswolds, and only a spirit of Yorkshire, uh, a lot of Australia, they don't need to go to 10 years. Yeah. Over 10 years, it's very hard to find whiskey that competes with Scotland. But I don't is, that, is that due to you know climatic conditions mostly in those countries like obviously Taiwan, Australia? The, you know, maturation is a much faster process than it is. Yeah, yeah, but 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 it's not just that. It's about yeah. size of the cask. It's uh, what the cask was used for. So they can't get sherry casks in um, Australia. Yeah. So they use a lot of red wine casks uh, from domestic red wine production. Yeah. Um, Australian oak, it, oak's an amazing subject because Australian oak, if there's a thunderstorm coming, Australian oak leaks. You can't mature whiskey in an Australian leak cask. Mm -hmm. um, uh, American whiskey, European, sorry, American oak and European oak, they react differently. So... Um, maturation is very different uh, it was it once explained to me i think it was jerry tosh at uh, highland park scottish oak doesn't see much sun so when it does it gnarls and fights its way up so yeah. it's very very intense ozark mountains it's cold in the winter the sun comes out oak shoots up so it stretches totally yeah. different oak yeah, Hungarian oak. I've seen Hungarian whiskey. Oh, sorry, Swedish whiskey in Hungarian oak at sixty-eight days, ninety-eight days, and it's as dark as chestnut juice. Yeah. So, yeah. so that that's a factor, but it's only one of many. And interestingly enough, uh, Taiwan has the same humidity as Scotland, pretty much, mm -hmm. but. A temperature difference of 17 degrees on average yeah so humidity is massively important in scotland but it's dreek it, it, it's damp yeah. and so the process of maturation is quite refined and slow and you can't speed that up yeah well we but, yeah but, well, that was one of the things that i was going to touch on because uh you are doing some work with uh, a swiss company called seven seals oh. And uh, you're there as a consultant, is it in that uh, realm? Yes. Uh, and they have a a young whiskey, but mature it before beyond its age, as you had described to me. What is it unique about there, and what? How, why did you get involved, and how did you get involved in that? So I, I, I for about. <laughs> three four years been arguing you know i always amuses me i'm sorry to sound snobby i don't mean to but it amuses me when people say do you know the sweet swedes can make whiskey and the, and the indians can make whiskey take me back 20 years you know that, i was saying that stuff 20 years ago so i so I've, I've been somewhere else i move on i just love discovering new places and um about four years ago i started realizing that some of the most dreadful whiskey i've ever tasted in my life had massively improved. Right. I, I, I mean, if I tell you that I couldn't give it to my enemies because it was so shit. Really? 
uh, there was Swiss whiskey. As soon as I got a bottle, I poured it straight down a sink because if I gave it away, it would reflect on my ability to know what whiskey was meant to be. It was just dreadful. Yeah. And um, but it's improved massively. And 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 so about four years ago, I started investigating that, and I came across a guy called Arthur Nagler. And Arthur uh, has a spirits academy. He trains distillers, and he's a lot better at the science than I am. But he's a friend of mine. And he will tell you how he tweaked all the production because what they were doing is taking brandy production, fruit liqueur production, Geneva production, and just applying yeah. it to whiskey, and it doesn't work. So he showed them what they needed to do. So it's a lot of um, Alpine whiskey, maybe five years old now. Yeah. And um, I used to go over and judge the whiskey tasting competitions over there. And I started talking about four years ago how the Alpine young whiskey was coming the right way. I did some great stories from Switzerland. In fact, my cover story in the next issue is Swiss. Right. But anyway, about, well, with, I think it's the last event I did before COVID lockdown. I went to um, Switzerland and uh, judged the tournament and there were brandies and vodkas and gins, but the whiskey was maybe 50 entries mm -hmm. and they included scotch. And I tasted them blind, always blind. And there were two so exceptionally outstanding that I ringed them and I walked up to Arthur and said, Arthur, these two whiskies are on another planet. You know, they're just on another scale. And he said, seven seals. Wow. And sure yeah. enough, they were. So I was introduced to the company, and I now work with them. I, I need to say this a lot because I need to be transparent. Because, yeah. Um, but the reality is that the chicken definitely came before the egg, or the egg became before the chicken. I definitely scored those whiskeys blind, having written a lot about Alpine whiskey. So I have no qualms about taking money from them. Can I uh, just pose a question here from Frank? And I know you've spoken about this in the past. So, uh, what do you think about the forced maturation spirits? Um, he calls it an abomination. Do you agree, for a start? Uh, yes, I do. I think it's there's there, it's more nuanced than that. So, so, seven seals I would defend as not in that bracket. Mm -hmm. I think the point is that there are three processes that happen have to happen in maturation. Oxidization, which is the coming together of air, which comes through the cast wall, and a spirit which is evolving. Yeah. Um, extraction, which is where you remove negative compounds, especially sulfur, and it has to be done in its own time. And addition, which is where you get color and flavor from the wood. Yeah. So if you take a bag of um, chips, wooden chips, and drop them into a neutral grain spirit, and they flavor and color the whiskey, yeah, that doesn't oxidize the product, and it doesn't extract from anything in that spirit. So to me, it's completely invalid. You can't do that. If you do what Seven Seals does, and this could take all night because I'm sure loads of people will not like what I'm going to say. But if you take a whiskey that is already a whiskey, I it's three to four years old, yeah. and you finish it in a process that includes subtraction, addition, and oxidization, I don't have any problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm working for a company that can take a four-year-old whiskey and you would taste it blind against 12-year-old whiskeys and choose it as the most superior because it tastes like it's 15 years old. And that's mm -hmm. and the reason for that is because the um the the the, the cask was never designed for whiskey, it was a happy accident, but it's actually a very inefficient means of maturation because uh, maturation happens between the spirit and the wood and in a ground cast that system relies on movement of the spirit and the cooler it is the slower that process is 
Yeah. But there are other factors like humidity, like heat. So, so naturally, that's this happens in India and Australia and Taiwan. But there are other factors, pressure, and all sorts of things. And so, the seven seals method is to up massively the contact between the spirit and the wood, yeah. and to make sure that that contact does exactly the same as what a cast does only far more intensely because there's more contact. And so I've dis described it as deconstructed traditional mat maturation. So, you know, you watch these baking programs and they deconstruct fish and chips and it's a bit of some rare fish with two chips sticking out of it and a bit of, I don't know, pureed peas and they call it <laughs> deconstructed Mushy fish. Peas. Yeah. Yeah. And they call it deconstructed fish and chips. Well, the seven seals process is patented, but it is taking existing whiskey, and I call it a finish. I don't call it, you know, accelerated maturation. Now, that might not be the perfect answer, but there are a lot of people doing stuff in laboratories in L.A. and stuff like that and saying they can uh, artificially reconstruct the me molecular structure of a scotch warrant. What a load of rubbish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, is that through agitation? Is it through a new, is it through a new shaped barrel or, or is it a trade secret they have? It's patented and yeah. to have full details, if you wanted to introduce it in Ireland, you would have to sign a non, uh, non disclosure agreement um it's unique and it's original um it includes what i can tell you is it includes um uh, so the vessel they store it in has oak sides mm -hmm. or at least if they don't now they are going to get oak sides because it's an irrelevance the process and it, it there, there is an element of um agitation there's an awful lot of emphasis on toasting and charring. Right, yeah. And all the materials used are from original oak barrels. Okay. okay. So, I, I mean, personally, I don't have a problem necessarily with it if it's transparent, you know, and I think we you touched on that earlier as well. What do you make of the level of transparency in the industry? Is it transparent enough? No, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I don't think it is. I think that, okay, so so, so you launch a, a, a non-age statement whiskey, right? Yeah. And you've told me for years and years that the average whiskey for this particular brand is 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And then you tell me this one contains malt between seven and 13 years old. Yeah. And you're hoping that I'll do the maths and conclude that means it's 10 years old. But not if it's 90% seven-year-old yeah. and 10% 13-year-old. It means it's averaging under eight years old. That's a I mean, lot. Do you want to go down the compass, compass box route and be that transparent? Yeah. Yeah. I think that I think that if you're going to tell me, no, no, Compass Box don't want to do that. What Compass Box want to do with blends is just not want say what's in it. Yeah, the exact composition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about I'm talking about the situation that you're leaving an unaged statement whiskey in the in the realm of being ten years old when it's actually a lie because you've put so much seven year old in. The average is actually closer to seven and a half. Yeah, and that's a lie, and I, I, I despair of having spent the early parts of my career explaining to people why color wasn't relevant because um, sherry casks and bourbon were different, first fill and second fill were different, uh, and on we go. And then suddenly, a major company wants to start, get rid of age statements under 18-year-old in the UK and only yeah. put out four colours and tell you that the whiskey is aged by the colour it's at. This is just bollocks. Excuse yeah. me. 
No, I mean, color is such a bad. Uh, but but you see, the problem, the problem, uh, Dom, is, and I've heard this firsthand from sales teams in the US, particularly, the dark color sells. It's, you know, and maybe it's an education process that has to happen, but dark whiskey sells. I know. But you see, a few years ago, we were winning the battle. Um, yeah. We were we were going through a stage where we were getting none. Sorry, we were getting um, uh, non chill filtered whiskies. We were not adding caramel because the consumer was knowledgeable enough to know that color didn't matter. We didn't mind it going hazy uh, yeah. if it was under forty six percent with cold water because that was what happened when you left in all the flavor compounds, and it was all going very very well. And the one thing we laughed at, I used to say, you know, I go to my corner shop, and there's a bottle of uh, blended Scotch whiskey at eight quid, and it's black. It's as dark as you like. Now, this is about the SWA. The SWA is meant to be protecting standards, but it allows coloured whiskey to be called single, sorry, to be called Scotch blended whiskey when it's out of a crap cask after yeah. three years and coloured with caramel. It's hypocrisy. Yeah. But, and I, you know, and I, I, I really feel there's certain subjects I feel very, very strongly about. And this is one of them. Well, I mean, the consumer deserves to know. There's no, no doubt about it. And I know here we're having a lot of uh, change in the labelling process, I think, underway. And not... You know, and it can never happen quick enough, I suppose, you know, uh, but transparency is is very much something that it, it is looked for now. Um, what, what else is there? I mean, are there, are there lessons that Irish whiskey can learn from, if you like, the mistakes or the positives that have happened in Scotland or other distilleries? Um, for me, it's very, very straightforward. I don't think that, you know, I, I, if somebody says to me tomorrow, you can't be objective about seven seals because you take money from them, I would say, yeah, but you only know that because I told you. Yeah. I'm totally transparent, and it comes down to me to transparency. There was uh, an example of a Welsh, sorry, an Irish distiller in the south west, no, southeast, um, who was bottling whiskey that he bought from overseas, giving them names that implied they were Irish, mm -hmm. and it was wrong. It was it, it was wrong. Uh, it's all about transparency. The fact is, you're entitled to experiment. You're entitled to go your own way. You're entitled to come up with a new product, but don't call it whiskey if it's not whiskey, and don't pretend you're not doing it when you are. Because you know what? People don't mind. Young people do not mind. Young people will drink a new product. If I mean, look at this joke category, hard seltzers, which are basically meant to be alcoholic water. What the fuck is yeah. that? Excuse me. What the hell is that? Alcoholic water. I mean, uh, you know, and that, but there's nothing wrong with the category per se. They, they're there for people to refresh after sports, etc., but don't try and convince me that all you're doing is diluting vodka down to 4% and it's flavoured with lime and lemon. You know, I mean, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and that's the point. And whiskey was always above that. Whiskey was always the cat. Rum has no credibility. Yeah. A gin, nobody knows what the definition of gin is, it even is. And you've got to have a, 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 an aspect of um, juniper. But some gins have no, they're just flavoured vodkas. So we have the moral high ground, and that's all I would ask, is that definitely do new products, definitely change the game plan for, for our children growing up. But don't try and pass it off as whiskey when it's not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a shame because it does tarnish the industry everywhere, you know, and... Uh, you know, people have, sadly have to be caught out in publicly a lot of the time. But uh, I don't know. Uh, are there there seems to be things that you are highly optimistic about 
in the industry and then there are things that if you like dismay you uh, what, what are some of the positive things that you're seeing and, and, and uh, within the industry apart from you know obviously we're attracting a, a different audience now to what there was before i mean and i would tend to think that's a, a positive thing well, what are the things that are give you optimism with the industry over the, the last few years Oh, uh, well, there's there's lots. I mean, I just love the fact that uh, I've lived long enough to see a new generation of distillers come into the industry. And when you talk to someone like Lewis um, Duckworth, his father launched Hartwood, and and he's a a real ochre Aussie. Yeah. And the guy, you know, I I just got him from day one, and Gave as good as I got with him, and he helped me define the expression "new world whiskey." He helped me define a scrapping rest of the world whiskey, which him and I did. He's got me to understand why you can't judge whiskey in the same way as Scotch, because Australian whiskey doesn't mature to twelve years. Yeah. And his son is twenty-three, and he's out there doing it. And Christy Lark. She's got her own distillery, and uh, Lewis's partner, whose name I can't remember, but it's Bill Lark's son. I just love that. And I, I asked the question in my magazine, you know, are we talking about a fad that might just fade away? Are we talking about legacy? These people are creating an entire culture for their countries or for their states because Tasmania is not a country. But, yeah. I mean, basically it's becoming defined by whiskey. And Ireland's just going into an amazing place. And you've got so many, so many talented people. That, yeah. um, Let's talk about Ireland, Ireland for a minute. I mean, uh, I don't know, you haven't been here obviously recently for a while, but wh what do you make of uh, the state of Irish whiskey and where it's going? Um. That's a more complicated question than it would. I I, I could give you the flimp, the, the flamboyant flippant. I'll, I'll tell you what I think is, it's in a very very interesting space. Now you've got Conor McGregor out there promoting a really shit Irish whiskey. Sorry, Conor, I don't. Mm. <laughs> um, but he. But he's loved in America, and my sons love him. And when I said I could talk about doing an interview with him, till yeah. I heard about something else, and I didn't think it was particularly nice to talk to him, I, um, I said to my sons, you know, I could talk to They were, you couldn't believe it. It was, you know, off the scale for them. Now, these yeah. guys are and women are approaching Irish whiskey for the first time. And, and if they come to Irish whiskey through Conor McGregor, and then discover all the great Irish whiskey there is. Uh, that's, that's massive. fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. The danger is, but it wasn't. But the proof is that it didn't happen in Kentucky. I had exactly this conversation with one of the great legendary uh, distillers in Kentucky, and he was saying they're drinking shit bourbon and rye in New York, and. Yeah. If they drink this stuff, these yuppies with the you know the suits in the in the city of New York, if they drink this stuff, they could kill the category for us. Yeah, yeah. But it didn't. What actually happened was these guys are stock market people and brokers, and they went out and said, "Well, that was good, but I'm told this is better," and they discovered bourbon. So it can be hugely beneficial, but there is a danger that it goes the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, you, you either introduce a whole new audience that has never really heard of Irish whiskey before, or you people just get dismayed with it when they try it. Or, you know, I mean, look, uh, he, I know Conor McGregor's whiskey gets an awful lot of stake, but at the end of the day, he introduced an awful lot of people to Irish whiskey. And it, it, it's a Irish style of whiskey that it's not difficult to approach either. Absolutely. And we're back to the point I made when I said, you know, some of these companies don't want to give uh, Dominic Rostro or or Jim Murray or Dave Broom their entry level whiskies because they need to appeal. It's a fine line between are you appealing to somebody who just doesn't know any better and therefore you're exploiting them? Or are you introducing them to the ladder that takes them up 
to the whiskies that Jim Murray and Dave Broom love. And, and that, that's exactly where we are with Irish whiskey. Irish whiskey is flourishing. And it's not just down to Conor McGregor. It's flourishing anyway. And, and what I feel about it is that I see so many, so many good distilleries in Ireland. I just, I'm really excited. I just hope, I think, did you tell me the votes tomorrow about the definition of pot still whiskey? Because that's really important. Well, it, it's imminent. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. So it's the technical pile, the technical pile has been revisited at the moment by the. It's really, yeah. really important that the likes of Peter Mar Ryan and Mark uh, Rainier and whoever else are allowed to not conform to a definition that is as bland as we're in a different era but if you look at irish history when the irish distillers came together and said right we're going to be 40 percent triple distilled blended whiskey with no peat when they said that that was fine but it was like scotch light and when john teeling came along in the late 80s and said no i'm i'm going to do double distilled i'm going to do peat i'm going to do Connemara, i'm going to do the industry nearly favor itself to close them down. Now that's where we are again, because it seems to me that Irish distillers have done an amazing job. I really have a lot of respect for the, you know, the, for the pot still arguments, etc. But it's important that Ireland is allowed to celebrate some of the things it did that weren't by the Puerto Rico definition of what pot still whiskey is. That's my view. Well, I mean, I, I, I'll have to pick argument with that in the one sense, you know, I mean, they have been one of the bigger supporters of this change. So, I mean... It, well, Irish distillers. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's not, uh, you know, um, they have not been opponents of that at all. Oh, well, no. that's good. I, yeah. I, I, I've only got praise for Irish distillers, you know, opening uh, their education centre, buddying up with the new distillers, trying to preserve the quality of Scot uh, Irish whiskey across the island uh, by helping people was yeah. very magnanimous and very big, and I have no criticism. Well, I think they see the big picture, you know, and, you know, Irish whiskey to do well and succeed internationally needs the category as a whole to be successful. And so it makes sense to for everybody to help each other. Totally you know. right, but, but who then objects to... Uh, the change in the pot still definition. That's another cop topic for conversation. Oh. But uh, you know, I I don't look on a whole on the whole. I think uh, there is an appetite and a recognition that there is a a new amendment required in the in the technical pot, and and that's going to happen, hopefully. Uh, but you know, um, the objections might come from places that you may not have expected. Okay. Yeah. But uh, look, I mean, I, I mean, I, I suppose you could look at Scotch and you could say, you know, are 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 is Scotland going to react in any way and and make any changes to their technical files? I know there's a bit of pressure, and and you know, some historical precedents have been discovered by Dave Broom and his uh, peers for possibly doing that. Is, is that something that may happen, or does it need to happen? I can't answer that question. It's very mm. rare I say those words, Serge, but to be honest, um, I'm not at the front line of what's going on in Scotland at all. Yeah. Have you, you know, shifted I've, now? I, I've had, I've had uh, six very tough years and I've struggled. And it's funny because I was going through my old emails to send links in the new magazine. Yeah. And I, I hardly spoke to anybody in Scotland for years. Uh, I have friends in Scotland, and I'm now talking to the new distilleries. But to be honest, I'm not at the front line of that game. They and they don't really contact me. And as I say, there's, you know, there's a whole little clique out there that doesn't really want me there. So yeah, but I mean, your focus is on world whiskey now, as you say. Of course. And, uh, look, you, you kind of, you know, we talked about uh, COVID briefly and, and Brexit and. You kind of touched on it briefly, Dominic, and, you know, I can see you're in a really good place at the moment, and you're not shy, and you're not, you, you've been willing to talk about the difficulties you've had of mental health and uh, and that, and I think, 
you know, when I see you in this form and I see the work you're producing and, you know, you're upbeat and you're, you know, in great form, you know, it, it's without sounding corny, it is inspiring in a way, you know, how difficult has it been for you? Like I said, you've talked about your, your depression and mental uh, difficulties. How big a journey do you think you, you've made yourself? And, uh, you know, is there any comfort you can give other people that are going through things? And, you know, I suppose, has has uh, has COVID exasperated that for you? Or actually, I mean, you seem to be one of the people that is better because of COVID rather than worse. Yeah, bizarrely, yes. I think that's right. I think the thing is, where I'm sitting now, uh, there's a curtain in front of me, but... Beyond that is the back garden, and, and beyond the back garden is miles of fields. Yeah. And this has been my view for six to seven years now. And so nothing changed for me with COVID, really, because I had become quite reclusive. I, if, if John invite, John John Burke invited me to Ireland, I'd go and I'd catch up with you or uh, I'd go to Scotland, but I wouldn't do it on press trips. So... Mm -hmm. um, I became, I became, I find it very difficult. I remember on an Irish distillers trip and they all went out. It was a, a red breast launch of some sort. And they all went out to see a concert. I think it was by the Dubliners. Mm -hmm. And I just stayed in the hotel because I couldn't do it. And I, I honestly thought at that point it was all over. Honestly Were you thought, able to write during this period? Yeah, because, <laughs> yeah, because when I was manic, I was, I was the ultimate genius, you know. I, I wrote a whole piece, a whole feat. No, I don't mean that. Uh, I wrote a whole feature about how to taste whiskey and colour. And I've read it many times since, and I don't know where it came from. But it, yeah. it's genius. It's just incredible. And I do taste in colour. I see colours. I see seasons. I see colours. I see uh, environments in when I'm tasting. So, um so when I was, but the worst of it was that the summer I went off sick and I was in a really bad place and I applied to my insurance company, mm -hmm. they would, they were so ignorant about mental health that they would say, well, you were online writing all this stuff. So you weren't ill. And mm -hmm. I said, I'm not, it's not like being on a tractor where you break your leg and you can't use the tractor anymore. The whole point about mental health is that I have periods where I can't get out of bed and I'm so depressed and suicidal. But at other times, I'm so manic and up and creative, I can produce amazing yeah. stuff. And as a result, they gave me £20,000 less than I would have earned that summer. And it and that was what sent me over the edge because we couldn't afford to lose that money. Yeah. They came and interviewed me and all sorts. I still think there's so much work needs to be done on this because – it was only time when I, if I'd had a broken leg, I'd have been paid twenty thousand yeah. pounds, because I had the ability to write sometimes, but I couldn't go to a Scottish or Irish distillery, and I couldn't consistently work. The problem didn't exist because they saw what I did when I did work. You see, so, that's part of the problem, I suppose, with the with the mental illness is that outside you can seem fine, you mm -hmm. know. I I wasn't fine. Back then I wasn't fine. I made a lot of that. I was very, very uh, – I, I, it was a terrible, terrible time. I, I was manic. I was – it was like living with Alice Cooper. You know, if anybody criticised me or I felt they criticised me, up would come Alice and say, don't you pick on him. But Alice wouldn't just say, leave him alone. He'd just go for them. And I – did very manic things. I used to spend stupid amounts of money. Uh, you you say to me tonight, uh, I've heard this album by a band called U2. I'd go and buy eight albums tonight, not one. Not one and think about whether I liked it. I'd buy eight. Uh, I, I did some crazy stuff and really, really quite sordid stuff. Uh, I was just very, very ill. And... Um, And when my insurance company turned around and said, oh, well, we saw what you – because when I was writing, well, I was writing really well. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the thing about mania. You know you know what stopped it? What stopped it was when, when it became clear that I was out of control 
and I tried to uh, I tried to blow up my career, uh, and so I was forced to make a doctor's appointment against my will. But I thought he'll just think you've been drinking too much, you've been self-medicating, and if you give up alcohol and drugs and um, settle down, you'll be fine. So I wrote him a long, long essay in advance saying, mm -hmm. I've got 10 minutes with you next Tuesday, and you're going to say you drink too much, you're in a bad state. And I said... Um, but that's not what I'm doing. And when I went in to see him, he said, I understood your letter entirely. In fact, you're not the only person in this room that's been through it. That saved my life. And he put me in touch with who happened to be his wife, who's a psychotherapist, who had my letter. And, uh, and I've built back from there. But it, I say to anybody... It's terrifying because it's embarrassing, it's sordid, it's horrible. You're made to, uh, mental health is mental illness is just it convinces you that you are completely and utterly worthless. And and I'm very fortunate because I was established. I'd written books. I was, you know, people knew me. I can't tell you how worthless I felt about myself then and, and didn't know how or who to talk to. And the only thing I'd say to anybody listening to any of this is that you can ring me 124-7 any time. Um, I don't mind putting my number online. I don't care. But you have always got someone to talk to. And this shit about you really, really need to talk about it. Most people don't want to know. You yeah. need to find the people who do and talk to them because they understand and I, I would do it for anybody in a I mean, second. can you talk to somebody that hasn't been through it? I mean, is it does it make sense? Or do you have to either talk to a professional or somebody that has been through it? No, no, what do you mean? Do you mean uh, a psychotherapist or or do you no. or somebody that has had experienced themselves no my, my 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 no what i'm trying to say is that thankfully there are lots and lots of people out there now mm -hmm. who are making themselves available on social media who would be prepared to talk to strangers i had people ringing me up or contacting me some in the industry and they know who they are and others who uh just saw the warning signs and said, I don't know who you are. I've read your book, never spoke to you, but if you want to chat, you, you can't ever, ever imagine what support that is. Yeah. To, to know that they're just offering themselves saying, but I'm more lucky than most because I kind of, I'm known by some people. So, but, but does that add to it? The fact that you have, you know, I, I know people and I know the fact that they're known and they have a, successful career only adds to their guilt about having depression sometimes oh without a doubt yeah without that's a, a difficult doubt. thing to explain oh uh, no no it's actually not it, the point is that uh for years and years and years i used to say <coughs> excuse me <coughs> i'm middle class and i'm moaning about the fact that you know my life's not great, but there's people starving in India or there's been a typhoon in, uh, I don't know, in Hawaii. And I people used to joke about the fact that Dominic was always worried when he had nothing to worry about. Mm. And so when you do have something to worry about, what you do is you try and contextualize it by finding somebody worse than you. And there's always people worse than you. There are people starving all over the world tonight. People yeah. living in the most incredible poverty. The world is a shit place. And I'm a socialist. And, uh, and so, so to be middle class and white and male and educated and then say, oh, I'm not really very fine. It's, but that's the guilt complex on top of the depression. Yeah, it makes it totally, even worse. Totally without a doubt. 
yeah. totally without a doubt, because people forget that actually it's not a choice. You don't suddenly wake up. When people say, oh, I woke up this morning, I was a bit depressed. They, that's not the issue. There is a point on the scale that uh, uh, applies to. But when you start going down that scale and you get to the position where you have no control whatsoever and you have no right to feel it, but you do, yeah. then that's serious. It's a kind it of a survivor's a guilt in a sense, you know. Yeah, you do. You start to feel very guilty about indulging yourself in your own mental health, but it's not a choice. I, I tell you who I don't like the man because he's very rude about the New Zealand All Blacks. Oh. But uh, Alistair Campbell, yeah, uh, the former Labour spin doctor, he talks very, very um, articulately about um, mental health. He's got mental health issues. And he talks about them exactly right. He get, he's hundred percent gets it. Um, when you when you get a day where you sit down on the sofa to watch breakfast news, but the wave is upon you, and then suddenly your wife's coming home at six o'clock in the evening, and you haven't moved, and you think, "What happened to my day?" That's yeah. called depression. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't happen to me very often because I ought to qualify all of this by saying I understand bipolar disorder because uh, there was one time where things were really off the rails. And I went to my psychotherapist and I said, I need to know what I am. Am I bipolar? Am I manic? What am I? She said, you're everything, but do not go to a psychiatrist and get put in a box because you'll never come out the box. That box will define you. And she was absolutely right, and I never did. But I have cyclothemia, not bipolar disorder, and it's it's all been uh, diagnosed and it's been monitored. And the thing about me was, or is, no, it is, is that I very, very rarely have full-on depression. I've probably had it three times in my life. And they are the three times where the black dog, is upon you the black clouds are rolling in and you can't do anything you physically can't do anything and it's very rare for me so i'm lucky because i'm I delighted to hear that because you know you know you, you'd be kind of half worried that the the code may have made it worse but I mean, you're not the first person to say to me actually that COVID hasn't mentally affected them in a bad way you know because they're used to almost the situation um, but that, I mean, that's not to trivialize it in any way. Look, Dominic, I, I'm delighted that you're in a great place. I, I love what you're doing. I love you the fact that you're outspoken and honest and candid. Uh, and you know, I, look, there are people all over the world that are huge fans. Of you. Uh, a lot of them are actually out in Asia as well, which is, and I know you've got a big fan base over there. Um, um, no doubt, Australia as well. W what's the future for you? What do you see as a uh, the next big challenge and the next exciting thing you'll be working on, apart from coming over here and having a few <laughs> drinks. Well, yeah, you, you summed it up. It's very simple for me. Uh, last year, I was faced with uh, reorganizing my work balance. My, I was meant to be doing something with Class Magazine, didn't happen. Whiskey mm -hmm. quarterly folded. So I went into consultancy. So I am paid by, write it down, I'm very honest, Seven Seals in Switzerland. I work for Fable, uh, which is uh, part of Sipwell Brands, and they've got uh, a new uh, range of whiskies out, which I selected, and I'm, I'm hoping to do some stuff with them when we can go back out and taste and do stuff. And um, a guy called Finn Thompson, who's part of uh, McGregor Thompson, who are a Scottish company going back 150 years. He's got some really aged whiskey from the 80s. And I've been helping him select and choose what we're going to bottle and do. So, so I'm making a good living now uh, yeah. from uh, retainers from my consultancy work. Uh, so that's great. Um, the magazine is my dream. You know, I, I used to do a thing called World Whiskey Review. And if you look it up, it was a load of text and the old picture. And now yeah. I've got a really, I think, the most exciting whiskey product in the market when it comes to. Second most. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't do Irish whiskey magazine which is obviously, no. but outside Ireland, I think I've got a really good product and, mm. um, and more of that. And uh, I'm desperately keen to get out there, you know, and 
I've been in, I said uh, before, I'm in this room for seven years. I watch birds of prey flying over there. It's great. But you know what? I can't, I, I miss the crap. I miss uh, Glasgow and Dublin, especially. Yeah. Going back to Switzerland, um, I've got some lovely friends out there and uh, basically get, yeah, just doing this. I, this is it now for me. I'm 59. I'm going to be 60 this year. And uh, I don't think I'm ever going to launch anything new or do anything new. But with the new magazine, let's just go there and see where maybe Whiskey yeah. Magazine might one day acknowledge I exist. <laughs> well, we acknowledge you exist. So that's a, that's a huge comfort, I'm sure, to you, Dominic. But look, I'm delighted that things like, I mean, you've got your you've got your finger in so many pies at the moment as well, which is great, keeping you busy and uh, active, which is I know it's it's important to do. But uh, really, I just want to thank you for for joining us on the show uh, and thank you for the advice you've given us as well in terms of our magazine and uh, the encouragement you've given us. Uh, that's really appreciated. You know, the experience can't be bought. And uh, look forward to seeing you when you do come over, or we'll head over that way at some stage when we can do all that. But uh, look, all I can do is uh, wish you the very best and uh, slauncher, Dominic. Thank you for joining us, and uh, the very best of luck with everything you do. So, thank you so much for having me on tonight. It's been a real pleasure as always, and I can't wait to catch up and see you soon. Thank you so much for letting me do this. It's been an honour and a pleasure. Oh, the honour is ours. Thank you very much indeed. Look after yourself. Good night. You take care. Good night. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Wow. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. I, I really want to thank Dominic there for uh, what was a very frank and candid uh, discussion. Uh, and, it's, you know, not everybody's like that. And... Uh, Personally, I really enjoyed it. I hope you did. I hope you got an insight into who Dominic is, what he stands for, uh, and why he's so loved. Uh, I think he is loved uh, amongst the industry, and uh, certainly the enthusiasts certainly are, are big fans of him. Thank you for joining us. We're back next week with a, an interesting, uh, an interesting topic and an interesting guest to. Basically, from nothing, started up a very successful business. And uh, we look forward to, to joining you next week. If you enjoy the show, please do give us a like or a follow on the YouTube channel. It really makes a difference. And I uh, look forward to catching you next week. And this will be available on, on podcast download tomorrow evening or the next day and available on YouTube. So thank you all very much. Take care. Look after yourselves. And God bless. Bye-bye.